You're listening to the Today in Manufacturing podcast. Hi, I'm David Manti, and welcome to a new episode of the Today in Manufacturing podcast. With me this week are Jeff Ranke and Anna Wells. We each have more than 15 years of experience covering the manufacturing industry. Every week, we take the five most popular stories on our websites and discuss the implications they have on the industry going forward. Before we get started, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You can also help us out a lot by giving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. Finally, if you want to email the podcast, you can reach any of us at Jeff, David, or Anna at IN.com with email the podcast in the subject line. We're also live pretty much every Friday, so subscribe to us on YouTube at IEN or at IEN Magazine to make sure you get a notification when we go live. Anna, how are you doing this week? Just great. How are you? It's good to see people. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to be around two adults at the same time and about to have a seven out of 10 adult conversation. How about you, Jeff? Good to have you back, man. Are you excluding Eric and Alex as part of the adults in the room? Is no, that... they're just not part of the conversation. They're oh. monitoring it. You know, <clears throat> I see. Okay. they're going to chime in every once in a while with a quip, you know, and then we'll laugh and everyone that's listening to the audio will be like, what? Did but you just I... give us a seven out of 10? Well, I mean, in like terms of like, I mean, it's not going to be like, you know, state of the union here. I mean, we're already at an eight oh. based on my poor banter. Time to tune off, everyone. <laughs> All right. Lower your expectations. Well, I am excited to be back. And now that the COVID plague has left my body, <laughs> <laughs> let's get rolling. But before we get started, we have a word from our sponsor. Manufacturers are facing extraordinary challenges today with labor shortages, supply chain disruptions, and a changing workforce. Complex industrial technology doesn't cut it on the front line. What's needed is a new way of working that will not only meet throughput goals, but change the shop floor culture to one of winning, where every worker feels they play a part in achieving the company's goals for success. What's needed is Red Zone, the connected workforce solution. And we're back. And before we get rolling, just remember, Red Zone's connected workforce software solution enables manufacturers to empower frontline teams in production, maintenance, and quality to contribute their full potential and achieve company goals around productivity and throughput. Red Zone software enables manufacturers, big and small, to boost their plant's productivity, increase employee engagement, and lower turnover. All good things. You know, it's the same every week. Mm -hmm. Sounds better every week. All right. Our first story this week. What takes years and costs $20,000? A San Francisco trash can. Six trash cans will hit San Francisco's streets this summer as part of the city's prolonged search for the perfect can. The city hired a local industrial firm to custom design a $20,000 trash can. On top of that, they made two other prototypes that cost taxpayers $19,000 and $11,000 each. A pilot program this summer will pit the pricey prototypes against three off-the-shelf options. Each can has a QR code and asks residents to fill out a survey. San Francisco started its search for the perfect trash can in 2018 when officials decided to replace more than 3,000 public bins that have been in service for almost 20 years. Now, the current cans have problems. The holes are too big, which allows for easy rummaging. The hinges need constant repair. The locks are easy to breach. They're easy to tip over, cover in graffiti, and they're even easy to set on fire. Now, a little bit about the prototypes. The soft square is the most expensive prototype. That's the one that's about $21,000. It's stainless steel and includes a foot pedal. The slim silhouette is $18,800 per prototype and made of stainless steel bars that would be a little bit less graffiti friendly. In one of the custom designed bin, if one of the custom designed bins is chosen, the cost to mass produce them will be between $2,000 and $3,000 per can. Anna, city officials say that they intend to pay no more than $3,000 per can, so they're really drawing a line in the sand. Well, the headline, I think, uh, draws a lot of ire when you read it. Not only just that price tag in there, which isn't really true to what they're actually going to spend on these cans, but also the San Francisco component, because <laughs> it 
San Francisco tends to be a butt of a lot of jokes, I think, when it comes to issues with their homelessness. But obviously, this is a nationwide issue, right? Mm. Um, San Francisco is not even actually in the top 10 of uh, homeless populations in the U.S. Uh, if you look at um, the issues that the city seems to be dealing with here, um, with trash and trash on the street, it really directly ties into that. But a lot of it's happening everywhere, right? So, um so I think maybe instead of cracking jokes about San Francisco <laughs> and mm. their situation, which a lot of people kind of did in the comments. Um, it's quite easy with this story. Right. Um, you know, I, I, I think like there's there's a lot of things to consider here. I mean, this this stuff is like, to me, infrastructure. It's not just a matter of, uh, you know, what does San Francisco need, but what does every place need? And cities are um, on the hook for certain things that, um, our infrastructure, I think, and nobody actually wants to pay for. Mm -hmm. I recently read uh, an opinion piece about the lack of public bathrooms in the U.S. Yeah. Um, and how it compares to other countries. Um, and, and America actually is relate, rated like very, very low on per capita public bathroom stalls. Mm. And um, I think the reason is because it's up to the local budgets to like incorporate this in, but nobody wants to. And so it's fallen on businesses to be like, it's like, so for example, Starbucks is saying, we're not going to be America's public restroom anymore. And they're talking about actually like maybe closing down um, their bathrooms or closing down stores because people are using their bathrooms instead of, you know, what should exist just out in our cities. Right. Yeah. So, um, I think when you look at trash cans and you think like $3,000 for a trash can, uh, like to me, it's the same thing. It's like, this is infrastructure that, you know, if you want these things to last and you want to target some of these issues, uh, which are, it, are safety issues. I mean, you don't want people like rummaging around people with very few prospects, I should say, rummaging around in a can that could have used needles in it. Um, it could, you know, could have any other kind of toxic trash. Um, they, they really do have to kind of look at what are our, specific needs in this specific city and not just say like, we can just put whatever trash can out here. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I mean, I know that some of these features are expensive, but they are public safety ones. And so I do think it's important to like go through the due diligence process, but yes, I feel like at this point it's getting like a little clownish and people are, are finding it funny to see like, okay, what does it take to like solve this problem? I mean, mm -hmm. it's something that maybe we could have have done by now. <laughs> yeah, it's a twenty year old trash can problem. Right, right, like, but but it really but it sounds it. like what they have in place right now is not working. Agreed, and it's I guess uh, we're lucky to live in a city like Madison that has really good infrastructure when it comes to trash collection, at least in my opinion, comparatively. Um, but I know, I mean, now I see that our trash cans on the street, which are simple, they're designed to be picked up by the regular. Uh, uh, trash collection vehicles that come by, you know, they just grab them with the automated arm and flip them in. And I mean, that seems like an elegant solution to me. And I just, the one thing Jeff that I thought was, I oh, mean, I hope that doesn't cost $3,000. Of course it doesn't. Because it's injection, like an injection molded trash can. Here's the thing. I don't think this is funny. I think it's incredibly frustrating. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I'm going to disagree with all, some of the things that Anna said. If we got to worry about somebody diving into a garbage can and hurting themselves, I don't feel sorry for them. Don't dive into a rubbish can or garbage can looking for anything. Mm. If it's in the can, it's gone. Yeah. Now, I'm all about having a garbage can that is easy for the trash collectors to pick up. Yeah. Okay. But if your issue is too much trash on the streets, why don't you go with the $630 version of the garbage can and buy five of them instead of one for three grand? Yeah. Just, what well, what am maybe, I missing here? Maybe they will. This yeah. is just a pilot. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, it's I just think a pilot. This, this whole process just seems so ridiculous. And I think it's it's really supported. Like the, the, the whole crux of this was a, a um, quote from the article from Beth Rubenstein. She's a spokesperson for the San Francisco Department of Public Works. And she says, we live in a beautiful city and we want the trash can to be functional and cost effective. But it needs to be beautiful. Yeah. No, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. I it's mean, a garbage can. Have you can you think of a beautiful garbage can that you've ever seen? I don't I make mean make it easy for the sanitation department, folks. Yeah. Make it utilitarian and, and very simple. Like when they were talking about these cans, I thought we were gonna be talking about something that I don't know had some sort of like 
uh, like biomass a digester yeah. in it or mm-hmm. something. And it was, yeah. it was, I don't know, processing the garbage in some way as well. This is ridiculous. And the fact that it has taken this long and the article spells out all of the other infrastructure issues that San Francisco just struggles with to have any movement on. Mm-hmm. And it's because a lot of the zoning laws, it's because there is so much political gridlock because Everybody is so concerned in a microcosm of how things affect their 10 square feet of earth on their, on their community as opposed to looking at the bigger picture and how this stuff can affect things. Who cares what the garbage can looks like? Buy the $600 can, put five of them out there, and maybe take some of these folks who – this is an oversimplification, but if you've got a homeless problem, you've got money where you can spend $3,000 on 4,000 trash cans, I don't know, maybe hire a couple of these folks to pick up garbage. Mm. Or, or find more support for them to try and figure something out. Exactly. Or, it seems like there's a lot of solutions here. And as opposed to finding, focusing on the aesthetics of it, why don't you actually get at the core problem and, and solve it? Uh, it doesn't seem that complicated. I think part of this is, uh, for me, was uh, this is what happens when you wait 20 years <laughs> to address a problem. Um, it's been... 20 years in the making, uh, they've had to have known for so long. And actually, a lot of it comes down to, like, problems with corruption in the public works department. Um, uh, What was the – so in 2018, uh, one of the things that I found that was funny was that – and kind of tragic. The city had to create a six-person poop patrol team that, uh, as a result of demand to power wash sidewalks, and now this, uh, the trash problem corruption that I was talking about goes back to a former Department of Works uh, director, Mohamed Nuru, who pleaded guilty in January to federal wire fraud charges. Nuru awarded this contract to maintain San, Francis- San Francisco's trash cans to a company that was owned by a relative of a developer who has now pleaded guilty to conspiracy and is cooperating with federal authorities in a case against Nuru. So it looks like there's a lot of problems that uh, have caused this great trash can debacle, but I just can't believe that it's come to such a head. Uh, that was the one thing for me that it, like, I mean, <clears throat> but note, like, I'll also note that uh, when we had our week off and I was up in the Northwoods, uh, Wisconsin, I realized how kind of lucky we are to live in a city like Madison again, where there are trash cans on the street, mm-hmm. where I was walking around a small town and I had something to throw away and there was just nowhere to put it. I'm like, well, I'm, like, I mean, if I was a different type of person, maybe I'd just throw it on the ground rather than really looking for a place to put it. But I mean, so I think sometimes it's something that we take for granted and it's something that you need more access to. And I think it could be a lot easier than this. Well, I just but I also think that like every city is different. And so the fact that they are looking at like, what are our specific issues here that we need to address? Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I know that you want to like, I know you don't agree with, with some of the points I made earlier, Jeff, but like. A lot of people are on the street in California because they can live out there in a car or on the street and not freeze to death. So it's not like California is like asking for this. Right. But, you know, many of them have um, substance abuse problems. Many of them have mental health issues. So it's not just an issue to me of like uh, you're on your own, figure it out. Like. I mean, if if this is an issue and and they're acknowledging it, they're just trying to deal with like the circumstances as they are, you know. But this is paralysis by analysis. They are overthinking this so badly that nothing's happening. I'd rather they did something and did it poorly than do nothing. Well, I also think that if they, I mean, I'm sure a city like San Francisco has a lot of resources dedicated to the homeless population. I mean, I feel that's a safe bet. Mm -hmm. But I I understand when you see a budget for trash cans like this. And then you think that maybe there could be other issues that could be addressed regarding the systemic problem. I I get that, you know, because like, I mean, I just see like $3,000 per trash can. And I mean, do we know what other trash cans cost? Like, I mean, well, they said up here, like, well, like they said the bottom, uh, uh, the bottom was like the range was like six hundred and ninety three dollars, mm-hmm. about six, se- yeah, to uh, three grand. And so, like, even that seems expensive to me. But like to Jeff's point, you know, you could put like four or five of those in for the cost that you're paying for the big one. And also, like some of the issues that have been reported with some of these prototypes have been kind of ridiculous. Like people were talking about like drip stains from inconsiderate coffee drinkers. In- I saw that too. And and it's I was just like. like that's a garbage a tr- can. Like, it's a trash can. It's going to get dirty. Yeah. So get over that part. Yeah. Right. And uh, the other thing was that even the ones that were made, so they were more difficult to tag with graffiti. 
are already covered in graffiti. Yeah. So um, you're not going to stop that. No, no I yeah. agree. The graffiti thing is just. I mean, you just got to paint over that. If, if I mean, it's not going to stop it. Yeah. So an interesting problem, and also an interesting look at uh, you know maybe a little bit of scope creep when it comes to designing a trash can. Just like <laughs> how long you've been working on that project? Nine months. The trash can. <laughs> <laughs> the one you open and all right, all right, man. Hey, billable hours, bud. All right, our next most popular story: one dead and nine injured after autonomous test car veers into traffic. On Tuesday, an autonomous steering car, an autonomous steering test car, veered into oncoming traffic in Germany. One person was killed, and nine others were seriously injured. The electric BMW iX had five people on board, including a young child, when it swerved out of its lane at a bend in the road, and it caused a series of accidents that involved four other vehicles, or four vehicles. After brushing the Citroen, the BMW hit a Mercedes-Benz van head-on, killing a 33-year-old passenger. The Citroen crashed into another vehicle with two people on board, pushing it off the road and causing it to burst into flames. BMW confirmed that one of its test vehicles was involved in the collision, but denied that the vehicle was fully autonomous. The vehicle was marked as a test car and was recording footage. Anna, BMW says that it's working closely with the authorities on the accident. And I thought, you know, a lot of times we hear companies that are really standoffish with this information. So at least I found it encouraging that BMW is willing to share information to see what happened. Yeah. And they should be, um, you know, it just, in this case, it just seems like another situation where the self-driving vehicles uh, might be truly at their most dangerous in this sort of intermediary stage. Um, you know, there's, I think six levels of five or six levels of autonomous driving zero, which is no autonomous driving. Mm -hmm. And then, um, five, which is completely driverless. And in between is this sort of massive gray area, which is where we are now. Right. So um, that's what you see in Tesla's autopilot, in the Volvos that, you know, that cra that one in the Uber um, in Arizona, Arizona that yeah. hit the pedestrian. Uh, the Chevy Cruze, which is, you know, cl close to fully autonomous, but um, you, it's still some of, some of these need to be in, in driver's control or they can't go above a certain speed or they can't drive in weather. Um, there is no driverless car that you can just get in right now and just go on your way and there's no restrictions, right? So again, as we've discussed in the past with autopilot, um, I think that there's this misperception on the behalf of the public as to what these vehicles are and and what, what they are capable of doing. Um, and you can see why, because there's so many different phases of partial, right? Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> I don't know what the solution is, but I do think that like we need to stop letting consumers be the guinea pigs in sort of vetting this technology. I think it needs to be tested by like a quality control and a dev team. Um, I mean, why on earth is BMW like giving the keys to this and then a child is in this car? Like to me, that's mm -hmm. sort of crazy. I, I don't know how you justify that. Um, I think they need to take the time and get real world data that is generated by their professional teams, you know, mm -hmm. because in this case, like even if um, no autonomous systems were in play when this accident occurred, think about the muscle memory that you have developed when you drive, mm -hmm. you know, I, that has to impact how someone might respond in these situations. Okay. So I think that that is evidence that sending these out and just saying like, test them out, try them, see how it works for you. Like there's a little bit more to it than that. And yeah. I think that like, if, if the potential consequence is somebody loses their life, um, we need to be looking more at like whose responsibility is it to play out these tests? Yeah. And it was actually, um, I found that language really interesting that, you know, they said, even if it's a self-driving car, it's still the driver that is responsible for the crash. Um, and I agree. I agree. Like I, my initial reaction was first a lot of anger because there's an 18 month old in a test vehicle. Mm -hmm. And, uh, an another thing is I completely agree with you, Anna, where like, I, um, I don't see, I understand how there's early adopters for technology. I get, I get that that's a thing. Everybody wants to be the first one that has it, but I mean, there has to be some better, more common sense in terms of like having a kid in there or even, you know, uh, paying more attention when you're using those features. I know that we've talked it a lot, talked about it a lot where semi autonomous seems to trigger this thing in everyone's brain where they think fully autonomous. And That's it's, the problem. Yeah. I mean, and like, uh, Anna, to your point, you said there's like five different levels. Mm -hmm. So I believe this was a level two advanced driver assist system. Yeah. But like, 
they still, they hear level two advanced driver assist system and they're like, I'm going to sleep all the way to work. I don't know. The problem isn't that it's, they think it's level two driver assistance. They, they are fixated on the driverless and autonomous terms. Mm -hmm. That's why there is, to Anna's point, all this gray area. Yeah. The technology is not gray in any way, shape, or form. It's the perception and it's the terminology these automakers insist on using. They need to stop calling it that. Mm -hmm. It's not autonomous. Mm -hmm. It is not driverless in any way, shape, or form. Neither is autopilot. That's the problem. Yeah. Even on BMW, which goes with the five levels of autonomous driving, level two basically says the driver continues to remain in control of the car and must always pay attention to traffic. Because yes, it can take over steering. Yes, it can park the vehicle. Yeah, it can change lanes and adjust speeds. But mm -hmm. it is called partly automated driving. Mm -hmm. That's what level two is. That's the problem. So all of these automakers in their rush to sort of force this technology on people because they're so proud of it. And look, I'll come out and say right away, once we get there, it will be so much safer. Mm -hmm. It will be. Mm -hmm. When we get there, I'm, I'm a proponent of it, continue to do the work, but you need to specify this is automated or assisted driving, not driverless, not autonomous. The other thing is with these automakers taking this approach, what it's creating is an upswell of negativity towards this technology. Exactly. Right. Yeah. People are scared to death now when you say driverless vehicles. And that's backed up with some, some um, research from AAA. 78% of the driving public that they surveyed has no interest in automakers even going near this technology. Mm -hmm. They say it's a waste of time. Don't bother with it. Another 86% say they don't want to get into a car with it or they would think twice about getting into a car that mm -hmm. has driverless technology. They don't even want to be a passenger there. Yeah. So why are the automakers insistent on pushing these termino this terminology and this technology when the purchasing public overwhelmingly as a majority is not interested? Mm -hmm. And number two, all you're doing is creating negative connotations and a lack of understanding of what fully autonomous means because yeah. we're not there. They need to pump the brakes. Sorry for the <laughs> no, term. Yeah. Yeah. But they do. They, they need to get their terminology right and call this assisted because the other thing that the AAA research showed is there is a lot of interest in assisted driving technologies, the lane control, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. emergency braking. Those are great things that use all of the same sensor technologies and cameras that autonomous vehicle operation at some point will also utilize. Get that stuff right because the drivers want it and work on these other things in a different fashion. But right now, don't call it autonomous. It's yeah. not autonomous. Yeah. And I mean, to Anna's point earlier, um, maybe, maybe just keep it with a dev team, you know, maybe don't roll. I mean, uh, maybe don't roll it out to beta users and test vehicles just because right now it has caused this groundswell of people that don't trust it and don't want it. Yeah. And it's caused a lot of negative publicity for all the companies that are doing it. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know. That just doesn't make sense to me. Um, did you guys also, did you look at the crash photos? No. I mean that ca the car, the IX is mangled. It is in a, like a W shape after hitting uh, the Mercedes Benz, uh, head on. And it is just incredible. I mean, I know that everyone is severely injured in that car, but that they made it out alive. Well, I wonder if one of the things, and this is pure speculation. Okay. I'm not saying I know, but this level two is only supposed to be in effect when you are under 38 miles per hour. Mm. Now, if the driver exceeded that, mm -hmm. the car could have kicked out of this autonomous oh. or not autonomous assisted driving technology. And that could have led to potentially losing control at a higher speed. If the if oh. the if the injuries were as bad as they are, mm -hmm. and all this. Now the other thing is, these accidents occur all the time with human drivers. Oh yeah. 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 But to your point, or to everything we've been saying here, it gets more attention because of the fact that it was in this level two automated, semi-automated mode. Mm -hmm. And. BMW again came out and said that the IX involved in the crash had no self-driving capabilities. Uh, with this level two, all it can do is accelerate and brake on its own, but it can't steer. So even at level two, it can't steer. Um, but still, as a result of calling it level two partly automated, that's how it gets interpreted. Well, and does it dull your skills a bit when you're used to the car doing that for you? Do you stop? Maybe mm -hmm. paying attention a little bit or you stop being so responsive? I mean, I think we've seen how a simple smartphone can dull people's senses behind the wheel. Uh, so I don't think we need to go like rounding any more of those edges. Like mm -hmm. uh, I think that um, I, I, I think it does, though. I think it would certainly like uh, I think your reaction time would would definitely suffer as a result. I mean, don't you? Yeah. No brainer. I mean, that was like I mean, uh we're old enough that we still had like a driver's ed class or at least I did. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those things where like uh, you sat in the fake cars with the big screen 
And we uh, didn't have the simulator. Oh no. man! Mm-mm. And then so we had the simulator where like uh, you could really like uh, it would let people know who saw the green first and uh, hit the gas first and stuff like that. I mean, I actually still drive that way now, but uh, it, I don't know. It's uh, so that was something that is baked in since like day one, mm-hmm. like reaction time and watching. And and you're right. Like if you start getting relying on systems, like it's going to, it's going to dull your senses. I don't know. Anyway, let's move on to our next most popular story. 3M could face bankruptcy over defective earplugs. J.B. Heaton is a litigation consultant and advisor to attorneys who represent hundreds of thousands of veterans suing 3M. This week, he appeared before a federal bankruptcy court in Indiana to discuss how the company could handle the lawsuits. 3M acquired the maker of Combat Arms earplugs 15 years ago. These plugs were used by the U.S. military from 2003 to 2015. The design was flawed, too short to properly fit, As a result, hundreds of thousands of veterans now suffer from hearing loss and tinnitus, or ringing in the ears. In 2018, the company settled with the U.S. government for about $9 million. However, 3M could still be on the hook for damages for more than these 230,000 additional lawsuits still pending. Last month, the company filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection for its Aero Technologies subsidiary, which would freeze any lawsuits against it. The proceedings this week will determine whether or not a judge will agree to also shield 3M from these lawsuits. A small number of lawsuits have already been wrapped up, and based on those results, 3M could face more than $100 billion in losses, and Keaton says the chances of 3M going through bankruptcy are, quote, more and more likely. Jeff, 3M says Heaton's testimony was, quote, unsupported and clearly flawed speculation. Seems like a lot of uh, legal theater with this one. Man, this is, this is crazy. There are so many components of this. We've mm-hmm. been following this story for a while. I think we've pretty much every time there's been a break in it, we've, we've talked about it. First thing that comes to mind for me is when you think of 3M, it's really an iconic American company. Mm-hmm. $35 billion in annual revenues, employs over 90,000 people around the world, just a huge, huge company. And the first thing that came to my mind is if they do have to file for bankruptcy and it does go down this path, is this another one of these companies that's just too big to fail? Like, mm. will the government step in? Are they going to get some sort of assistance, even though basically they screwed the government and to, mm-hmm. got this whole thing going? So how that could shape up or form out is going to be interesting to see how that goes too. Digging into this a little bit, 3M really initiated all of this. I mean, in addition to the things that they did in creating a defective product, this goes back actually to 2012 when 3M sued a company called Moldex Metric Mm. for intellectual property rights. Basically, they said their earplugs were too similar to theirs and they got into a legal battle. During the course of this, Moldex Metric uncovered some testing for this earplug that Mm. basically spelled out all of the defects that were there. They found the testing where it indicated that it did not level the offer the level of protection that it said it did. Mm -hmm. They had this all spelled out in all of this testing stuff. That's what led to the whistleblower lawsuit Mm -hmm. that allowed the U.S. uh, Department of Defense to get that $9 million settlement initially. So basically, if 3M hadn't filed that original lawsuit that led to their competitor having this discovery opportunity to find all this test results, it wouldn't have led to the whistleblower lawsuit and potentially not all of these now individual lawsuits that they're facing. The last one was $77 million awarded to an army reservist um, for yeah. the for the damage that was done to his hearing. $100 billion is probably on the low side. Yeah. When you do some of the math, they've gone 10 and 6 on these suits. Yeah. They've 10 went to trial and they had settlements. Six were thrown out. Man, if you continue with the math and you're conservative, that could be more like two hundred billion in yeah. settlements that they're dealing with here. Mm-hmm. It is incredible, Jeff. I had no idea that uh, they had started that. Imagine the executive that's like, you know what? We got to go after Moldex. Yeah, exactly. Ooh, hope his parachute. And how was did golden. that? And how did that? Te- those testing documents. I mean, <laughs> somebody had to be in charge of shredding those, right? right? Like how I they mean, get those? Yeah. Yeah. yeah like, uh, hey, man. Uh, before you handed over the box of documents, uh, you checked them all, right? No, why? Mm. Yeah, all right. Yeah, that guy's in trouble. Um, Anna, what were your thoughts on uh, 3M? Uh, to Jeff's point, we have been covering this for the last four years now. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I mean, since the beginning, it's always looked like it is not going to fare in 3M's favor unless they can get some sort of 
protection uh, around a potential settlement or hundreds of thousands of settlements. Yeah, and they're being pretty aggressive, I think, right now, but also uh, their strategy seems a bit transparent and it seems to be like pissing off <laughs> the judge yeah. involved in the case. Mm. Um, so, uh, as you mentioned, their subsidiary Aero Technologies has filed for bankruptcy, but um, this division was not operating mm. um, and it was actually like resurrected. Um, so they to must, bankrupt? To bankrupt it. Yeah. So, um, oh. So it was resurrected like kind of in the weeks leading up to the bankruptcy filing. Mm. Um, so I think it's pretty clear that they're trying to make Arrow the fall guy here and then maybe create a clean slate for the larger enterprise. Mm. Um, I read uh, an interesting analysis about this in Reuters and I understood about half of it. <laughs> <laughs> Legal analysis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, according to this report, the judge in the case, quote, is – deeply skeptical of 3M's motives for resurrecting its once obsolete subsidiary, saddling Arrow with all of the liabilities, basically through a last minute funding and indemnification agreement, and then sending Arrow off to bankruptcy court to request a stay of all the other litigation. So the plan, I think, is to let Arrow shoulder this entire thing and then in the bankruptcy proceedings try to petition to not, yeah. not go after 3M, the larger 3M corporation. So the judge, I think, is pretty mad about this. Mm. And it sounds like she's making some very interesting like uh, requirements that may or may not hold up about what they can and cannot do in the bankruptcy proceedings, okay. and what they can and cannot ask the judge. So this is going to get more interesting. Um, yeah. It's definitely one to follow. I don't know how it's going to go. But to Jeff's point, like there's so much money on the line here, 230,000 pending lawsuits. Yeah. That mm. is incredible. Yeah. So this is going to be a big deal for 3M. No matter how it goes, it's going to be a big deal for them. Well, and I talked about how it's all legal theater right now. But like at the end of the day, soldiers suffered and continue to suffer. And there has to be some sort of compensation for that. Um, also, I wanted to note that 3M did commit to set up a $1 billion fund for those deemed eligible for compensation over hearing loss. It seems like, you know, they try, you know, while they did try protecting themselves uh, by bankrupting an already dead subsidiary, mm -hmm. you know, they also went on the other end and said like, hey, we'll try and set up this fund and help people out. But again, it's like 1 billion yeah. compared to 100 or 200 billion. That's where you kind of get caught because first of all, they falsified testing results yeah. to the Department of Defense. So Did it's, they, it's or, hard to go back and not, well, okay, so. It's the company that they bought that falsified the testing. 3M right? knew about it. Oh, okay. 3M okay. knew about these testing results. They had already acquired the company at that point. So they knew about it from the start, okay? Yeah. So you they're there in the wrong. Mm -hmm. A nine million dollar settlement with the Department of Defense, super weak. Yeah, Easy. and, oh, yeah. and no they kidding, get right? off saying it wasn't our fault. Yeah. Basically, they just settled it without oh, having yeah. to take any blame for it. Yeah. So yeah, but you have two strikes against you. So the billion dollars they're offering there, yeah, it feels fair. But at the same time, if these juries are awarding an average of twenty million per settlement, man. Mm -hmm. That is scary. The other thing, just kind of wondering, and I don't know that we have any way to even guess, but when you look at the IP that 3M owns, oh. I mean, if they got to a point where they they went through bankruptcy and they had to settle all these suits, they started selling that stuff off. Man, what yeah. kind of? I mean, the what what that company is actually worth? Just in, I mean, you, this is the company from a materials perspective. Everything from post-it notes to sandpaper mm -hmm. to safety equipment. Oh yeah, I mean, just the. The wealth of information and product development within those walls is kind of mind blowing. That's that's how they petition for their bailout, right? Yeah, you're I probably mean, right. Yeah, yeah, just walk down any like aisle at Menards and see how many things say 3M. Yeah. Um, no, Jeff, to your point, um, when I read the story when I was uh, working up when I was working up the story for the podcast, I definitely checked a second source because I'm like, there's no way that was nine million. That had to be a B, yeah. right? Um, but no, that's. Uh, that's the DOD wanting this to get go away as quickly as yeah, 3M Yeah, it's a slap on the wrist from a uh, partner. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Our next most popular story this week. A court sides with manufacturing worker who called in sick via Facebook. Casey Roberts was fired from his job in Gestamp, West Virginia, at Gestamp, West Virginia, a metal stamping factory that supplies the auto industry. Roberts missed several weeks of work after a emergency appendectomy 
turned into an infection. We feel for you, Robert. Uh, Casey, <laughs> we feel for you, Casey. Emergency uh, appendectomy. Yeah. Solidarity. Yeah, two-thirds of the panel understands your <laughs> I still have an appendix. Yes, I'm the guy. You don't need it, Jeff. Overrated. <laughs> I, don't, I don't miss it at all. Nothing but yeah. trouble. <laughs> nothing but trouble. Now, according to Reuters, Roberts took six weeks off under the Family Medical Leave Act for his surgery and recovery. After he came back to work, an infection put him back in the hospital. Rather than using the company call-in line, he reached out to his supervisor via Facebook mes- Messenger. Roberts was then fired for abandonment. Roberts and his lawyers say it was a violation of his rights as well as retaliation, and a judge initially dismissed his claim. However, a three-judge panel who heard the appeal cited evidence that Roberts had communicated with his supervisor via Facebook previously, which established an informal practice that was regularly accepted by the employer. The case is significant in determining whether informal communication methods are permissible in workers notifying their employees of their need for sick leave. Jeff, I want to know where you stand on this because I know that everybody that has had to work with one hates call-in lines. They're terrible. Uh, But I feel like this is kind of on the manager for accepting that and not kind of really laying it out as to how you have to notify when you're going to be out. Okay. So just, I just want to confirm a couple things, right? The automotive supply chain is a hot mess right now, Mm -hmm. right? Oh yeah. The labor market is very difficult in terms of finding and retaining employees. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yeah. Okay. Now to go to this extent (laughs) where not only had the guy used a line of communication that had been previously established with his supervisor. Oh yeah. Then to go to court twice over making sure you didn't have to welcome this individual back. Is this person either a bad employee that they're looking to get rid of and are sort of using this as a reason to do it? Or is this just completely tone deaf management here? Because it seems like it has to be one of those two things, mm-hmm. right? Maybe a mix. With with all of those factors, if you have somebody who is capable of doing the job and wants to be there, but I mean, it was an emergency. But a piece of their body exploded. I mean, right? (laughs) Okay. You'd think you could sort of make an exception here. This is not like a mom and pop operation either. This is a $135 million company. So Mm -hmm. they've got a little bit of wherewithal to, I would think, handle one person being out, even if they were unexcused for a while, to maybe welcome them back into the fold. I don't know, slap them on the wrist, say, hey, call the call the uh, hotline next time or the yeah. call-in line next mm-hmm. time, okay? It seems like this got blown way out of proportion. And again, when you're looking at a labor market that is so tough right now, why would you want these kind of headlines? Mm-hmm. I mean, just welcome the guy back. And if you really don't want him there, figure out a different way. Don't yeah. do it this way when it attracts all this attention and just the resources. Mm-hmm. Oh, this yeah. soaked up, going to court twice. No kidding. Mm-hmm. Who wants to deal with this? You know who wants to deal with this? overzealous HR departments are yeah. feeding off of this. Love it. This is their wheelhouse. This is what they've been trained to attack because this person took advantage of the company. And I mean, sorry, that's just uh, what I um, hear. It's a couple hundred million dollar company. And, you know, they have a call in line that is probably set up by a human resources department. That's like, hey, we have a very clear way of calling in. They didn't do it the right way. That's inexcusable. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, you know, I think you swayed me to just really blame HR, Jeff. Which well, I will do all like day. It seems like they're way too hung up on the process as yeah. opposed to what was really going on here. Agreed, agreed. And Anna, what were your thoughts on it? Just because I get it. Also, when you're in the middle of an, a medical emergency, yeah, yeah, I know. It's just like he's lucky that he was able to te- text anything via Facebook Messenger because you know he was going septic when he was doing it, like. Hey, FYI, <laughs> I think I might be dying. Yeah. I can't make it. You know, it, I don't know. It's just a bad situation. All I've over. already been delivered anesthesia, so I might not finish the sentence. Mm-hmm. Um, no, I know. I thought it was like, I was actually surprised reading the comments on IN.com in response to the story. People comparing this message to like smoke signals and saying that this is the kind of stuff that's ruining America. And I saw it differently, like as more of like a victory for employee rights. Um I mean, the reason that they ruled in his favor, as you mentioned, is because he and his supervisor had communicated on work issues in the past. Yeah. Um, And I know I like text my boss all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, Is that protocol? Probably not. But if he responds to and acknowledges those messages, so what? Mm -hmm. Um, And secondly, like you mentioned, the situation was an emergency. Like, yeah, if we really 
I don't know. I've, to me, it felt like retaliation or like this kind of a, a gotcha situation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, because like Jeff said, um, there's got to be another reason why they want to fire this person. And to me, you know, it seems maybe obvious. I don't know that, um, that he, he missed a lot of work Mm -hmm. and so they're tired of it. Right. Um, and so they grabbed him on this technicality, which I believe was incredibly unfair. And I know that not everyone is going to like what I'm going to say here, but I do think, um, that these kind of strict policies and protocols turn people off from corporate jobs, Mm -hmm. uh, the dress codes, the efficiency tracking, the HR policies, as you mentioned, that are so concerned about what's fair that they don't take any common sense into consideration. I mean, I've definitely called in sick from the hospital before. It's kind of a vulnerable place to be. Yeah. Um, and I just find it hard to justify this kind of response um, unless you're trying to push this person out for other reasons. Mm-hmm. And it, it seems like they were. Yeah. No, I've done the exact same. I've called in sick via text while going into emergency <laughs> surgery for an appendectomy. For this exact so, thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for this exact same thing. So I got a lot of sympathy here. Um, so... We do have uh, one person that's watching us live. Jesse says, my employees text, Facebook message, and even LinkedIn message uh, message me if they need me. Exactly. Which I also, so to that point though, um, that's one thing that I think as a manager, you have to clearly communicate like your SOP, mm-hmm. which if you're willing to do that, which I think Jesse as a manager, if you're willing to do that, you're going above and beyond. But if you're a manager, you have to be, you, you have to say like, hey, you can only reach me via text or it's got to be this call online. Like, I get get it, you know? And I also, I also wonder how the manager feels because I wonder if the manager would actually side with the worker, but he was also kind of caught in one of those legal situations where like, you have to play ball with the company and HR. Could definitely be overzealous management t- stepping in here. But, you know, what Jesse just mentioned is you say it's going above and beyond, and it can be. Okay, yeah. that, that could definitely be the case. But that's also evolving towards meshing with this new generation of, of the workforce. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This is how they communicate, okay? Calling one of my daughters and actually calling them on the phone and getting them to say something, I'll get one or two words if I send them a text. That's how they are used to communicating. So you know what? I can either dwell on the fact that they don't talk to me on the phone or I can just use my phone to text them and get the full message. Yeah. What do you want to do here? Well, and and it seems like such a, it just seems like a very small concession. Very. Yeah. No. And, but I mean, there's, there are Slack channels, there's uh, Microsoft Teams. There's so many different ways to reach out oh. to an employee or mm-hmm. a coworker or a boss these days that again, that's why I'm just saying. It has to be spelled out, you know, and it just, I mean, this just, I understand that a lot of companies work on these points or like demerit systems, but there has to be compassion, especially when there's a medical incident. Um, We have another person watching live, Austin. We're getting people fired up with this Uh, one. I like it. He says he only monitors text, email, or phone, but times are changing in the workforce. Way to not take a stand on anything, Austin. No, just like this is how no, I do it. I think it. he's saying yeah. exactly what we just were talking about. Yeah. yeah, and 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 in this case, it looks like oh, and Microsoft Teams. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, he's in, got four to monitor, Austin. That seems like a lot. In this case, I think the reason the panel sided with this individual is because there was a track record in the past of his boss receiving messages via yeah. Facebook and that being tolerated. Yeah. Like I think if he just out of the blue sent something to a platform and he doesn't know. If he's yeah. going to, if he checks it or if he's, but he knows that he checks it because yeah. he's done it before. Well, and, and that's also, why, that's why they said this, this is okay. Right. Yeah. And when you can see when somebody reads it on Facebook messenger, you can see that they've read it. Mm-hmm. Like it's, you can confirmation. Uh, that was also another part of this where I was like, okay, the boss is Facebook friends with them. Uh, so maybe they, whatever. Um, now, uh, so the other thing I want to say is that he was only out like nine weeks total and FMLA entitles workers up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave. Um, and so, uh, uh, the first case was actually kicked out because they said that, um, he did not use usual and customary notice and procedural requirements for requesting leave. But the reason that the three panel judge, uh, the three panel judges, um, said that it does is because judge Albert Diaz wrote Usual and customary procedures include any method that an employee has by informal practice or course of dealing with an employee regularly accepted along with those in employer's written attendance policy. So both. Yeah. Yeah. And it just, I I don't know. That seems like a real game changer. uh, Anyway, good to get the comments from people watching us live. I Mm -hmm. like this. I like this. Mixing it up. Sorry, Austin. I was a little harsh there. You're doing great. 
You're doing great, Austin. All right. <clears throat> was that like a high five? Was that like, was that? <laughs> oh man, the podcast high five. I don't think we can get that off the ground, but I'm All willing right. to try. <laughs> Are you high fiving the screen? I'm but... high fiving Austin. Just like, man. Oh. No, actually, I was just going to like, man, I'm sorry. He did not high five you back. I I've, guarantee it. Again, I like, I've just, again, I've been quite isolated the last three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, if it seems like my, uh, my uh, hand movements are something like you would normally do when dealing with a toddler or a younger, you know, that's where I'm at. Yeah, Alex had to adjust his headphones after your intro. Turn your volume down a little <laughs> bit. I'm a, yeah, I'm excited. I'm just, you know, it's great. I haven't had to, like, discipline anybody or just say I was disappointed at anyone. <laughs> I, haven't had to, I haven't had to, like, go for snacks. And like because you in this can month, always get us snacks. Well, by I mean, the way, that's yeah, fine. why do you think you haven't had to go for snacks? I mean, it's like we're an hour in. That's like two to three snack breaks that I got to take normally when I'm working at home. Somehow like, we have bags of Cheetos out on the snack counter. I don't know how those have lasted. Oh my god! Because I haven't been here. Can Man. I? Can I tell you why? Hmm. Okay, an unnamed colleague, unnamed, uh, said I brought in some Cheetos because I bought a variety bag of chips and I don't like Cheetos. What? What? <laughs> Who doesn't? That's insane. I was like, oh. How are we going to smoke out Tell this me I can't trust eating? you by not telling me I can't trust you. Man. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to keep it wow. to myself and I'm I'll going... let this individual come forward when they're ready. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but don't worry. I gave them a lot of flack for it at the time. So. I'm going to take a bag of Cheetos home so I can make a peanut butter Just and Cheeto sandwich. Drop those on. on my desk. Yeah. Mm. We could we could do like Cheeto fingerprints to like <laughs> see <laughs> who has like clean yeah. hands then we'll know. Fireable offense says <laughs> Jesse. That's Jessie. right Jesse. Disliking Cheetos is a fireable offense. Not comfortable with it. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Not in, not in our house. <laughs> All right. Our most popular story this week. EV battery factory on quote life support. British Bolt was founded three years ago, and it has the easiest name to discern what they do in the world and where they are located. The company wants to build a giga plant in the northeast of England to make batteries for domestic automotive manufacturing. The battery factory would be the fourth largest building in the country. The government backed the factory with tens of millions of dollars, but now the project is on life support, according to internal documents. According to a report in The Guardian, the company and its primary contractor have limited construction on the site until early next year. The hope is to curb spending while the project raises more funds and builds up needed power infrastructure. British Bolt has received commitments of more than $2 billion from both public and private sources, but contingent on meeting certain goals. The project is expected to cost $4.6 billion. The company downplayed the phrase life support and said it only applied to select parts of the project that were awaiting final design decisions. According to the company, must, much of the project is ahead of schedule, which still sees production starting in 2024. British Bolt had, has had typical startup issues, especially with a project at this scale. But Jeff, I don't know if you saw this. The company's co-founder also had to leave the company two years ago after it came to light that he was convicted of tax fraud in Sweden. Yeah, I mean, that's concerning, maybe. Yeah. We're talking about a $2 billion shortfall on a production project. This is interesting for a couple of different reasons. The one that kind of struck me is digging into this a little bit deeper. The UK auto manufacturers are facing a lot of the same mandates that US auto manufacturers are facing regarding EVs and sourcing materials. So they're under some mandates within the next couple of years. Right now, they're allowed to source up to 70% of everything that's used in an EV to produce an EV uh, can come from outside the country without facing any tariffs. Oh, okay. That's going to be cut down by to like 50% in the next couple of years and go from there. And then pretty soon it's going to start focusing on the batteries, just like we've seen here in the U.S. So building this automotive, this part of their automotive supply chain and infrastructure is incredibly important. Um, so when you look at how short they are in terms of coming up with the funds for this, you wonder what's going to happen here. If this is going to turn into some sort of joint venture with mm -hmm. some of the automakers in that area. Um, they've also got a big issue over power, like mm -hmm. just getting enough power because it is extremely power intensive in terms of creating these batteries from a production perspective. So they do have a couple of huge issues there. What you would think in looking at the lay of the land, however, is because this is so critical, um, 
it's gonna they're gonna figure out a way i think mm -hmm. to make this get this plan to come to fruition and start producing these batteries because they have to the uk automotive sector is is going to be relying on it the next thing that's going to be very difficult for the uk and really the eu is they have very limited supplies of all those rare earth metals mm -hmm. in terms of producing these batteries so they're still going to be having to bring a lot of these materials in from the us from asia from wherever africa wherever they can find them because they don't have much going on there. There's only one lithium mine right now in the entire <clears throat> EU. Um, that's in Portugal. So not, um, not the best situation from a supply chain perspective there. This seems like step one in mm -hmm. rectifying a lot of those challenges. So we'll see what happens there. But again, I you would think the automotive community would sort of get behind this because they may not have a choice. They need to. Yeah. yeah. Anna, was it not lost on you that power is a problem and it's actually at the site of an old power station. Uh, <laughs> it just seems like of all things they had access to, power would be one Power is it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, um, that's, a, uh, that's a question I can't answer, what, what the role is of that. But um, I think they were depending on a lot of renewable stuff, especially oh, okay. like wind and um, um, geothermal so, type oh, stuff. Okay. That's just not, is there, it, not at the level that they would need it to really support such an intensive mm -hmm. production process. Okay. Well, and unfortunately, right now is like the hardest possible time to be undertaking a giant construction project that's yeah. multi-billion dollars. Like mm -hmm. everything is behind. Everything costs more. <laughs> Probably from when they budgeted this out even just a yeah. couple of years ago. Um, who knows what it has ballooned to since. Um, you know, I think this this w was a popular story because we have been covering how many investments in EV battery production um have, have been taking place in the U.S. in the last few months. Um, and so at first I was like, eee, but um, but then you read it and I don't know, I guess I, I'm i not feeling the heat so much uh, once you learn the details of what's happening here because it's very specific. But mm -hmm. a lot of the factories that are coming to the U.S. or expanding in the U.S. are very established battery companies, you know, Panasonic, SK, LG Chem. They, they've done this before. Um, this company is three years old. Yeah, yeah uh, they're a rookie. That tripped me up a little bit, yeah. to be honest with you, because like the UK government has put a lot of money into this project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I know that it's necessary, but I'm kind of surprised that they weren't able to start with um, something that was a little bit more established to kind of get the ball rolling here. Um, you know, this company is younger than my kids for whom I still like <laughs> cut, uh, cut their grapes in half. You know, it's just yeah. it seems like a three year old company. That's not much time at all. But um you know, it's exciting to see that globally the buzz around EV development is is happening and the related components, it's all happening everywhere. But I think maybe there's something to be said about putting your resources behind someone who has um, some skin in the game already. Yeah, and, that's a good point. And, and a little legacy. Just, yeah, just it, it seems like maybe some of the problems that they're running into, maybe they've been encountered before and they can kind of figure those out a little easier. But Well, first of all, I think it's time for the kids to go whole grapes. I think they're all right now. You Don't know, rush that. Okay. That can get scary. I, it scares me. And yeah. I, like, I, then I, it stresses me out. I got to oh, yeah. watch them eat their grapes and it's super creepy for them probably. No. Yeah. So. I completely understand that, like, uh, where you're, like, your eyes are bulging out of your head as they're, like, slowly chomping on a grape tomato. I get that. Because I have a very gracious neighbor that is just keeping us flush with grape tomatoes and Caden is just, like, shoveling them in. And yeah. I'm like. Maybe just one at a time. Take a bite. Maybe one at a time. Take yeah. a bite. Can we start yep. chewing? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, to your point about like how many millions are invested in this, they're also like it's a huge bet in terms of jobs. Like, yeah. uh They want this plant to create three thousand jobs, so it would be big. And I mean, uh, I just feel like right now they're not too far into it. Mm -hmm. But uh, and it sounds like they're still going to continue to deliver key materials to the site, you know, but it's because cost of materials, like you said, Anna, are off the charts. Uh, basically, some of the officials were talking about to the BBC about how people want to see like piling or drilling the foundation and they want to see steelwork. You know, they want to see progress, but they're just not going to see that until February. And I liked one official who told the BBC, quote, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, they were definitely trying to calm everybody down. And I think with this this whole thing, this British vault, just the whole venture, I mean, you're just seeing more geopolitical pressures. Everybody wants to get their supply chain out of China right now. Mm -hmm. and that's that's got to be the big reason that the British government has gotten so heavily involved here and why everybody wants this to happen 
now. Yeah. Let's get it going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I mean, with them sort of easing with the don't worry, at least it seems like the local government is on top of it. Like, uh, yeah. you know, they're monitoring it closely. They're, they know what is happening and they're not just like, I'm sure they'll figure it out. Well, it was, it was interesting, too, because this came out just as I was finishing up that book, You Let Me oh, Foxconn. Yeah. And when they talked about power issues, I immediately thought about infrastructure and the government getting involved. And, man, you just can't shake what you, when you've seen some of that stuff, what's, what's gone down, gone on here in Wisconsin. And hopefully the uh, those types of mistakes are not made here. No, this these were not. And this wasn't a long this wasn't a long article. And the uh, articles in The Guardian and the BBC, they weren't long articles. And it was like every other sentence. I'm like, ooh, red flag. Ooh, yeah. red flag. Yeah. <laughs> Looks a lot of bad going on here. All right. Well, before we move on to in case you missed it, we have another word from our sponsor. Manufacturers are facing extraordinary challenges today. With labor shortages, supply chain disruptions, and a changing workforce, complex industrial technology doesn't cut it on the front line. What's needed is a new way of working that will not only meet throughput goals, but change the shop floor culture to one of winning, where every worker feels they play a part in achieving the company's goals for success. What's needed is Red Zone, the connected workforce solution. And we're back. Now, just a reminder that Red Zone is great. Red Zone's connected workforce software solution enables manufacturers to empower frontline teams in production, maintenance, and qual quality to contribute their full potential and achieve company goals around productivity and throughput. Red Zone software enables manufacturers, small and big, mixed it up there, you know what? Keep everyone on their toes, to boost their plant's productivity, increase employee engagement, and lower turnover. All right. Still all good things. That read never gets old. I like it. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's move on to, in case you missed it, some of the stories that maybe weren't as popular on our websites, but still stand to make a big impact on the industry going forward. Uh, I'm going to go first this week, if you guys are cool with it. Um, my story. No. Change my mind. I was cool. Now. <laughs> all right. Go ahead. Jeff's going first. Nope. No. <laughs> all right. Well, a reminder to not ask next time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a company was charged in a worker death after repeated injuries. On August 16th, 2017, at 6.45 p.m., a 45-year-old woman was pulled into an unguarded plastics machine at ABC Polymer Industries in Alabama. Catalina Estelado, or also known as Ava Sands, was pronounced dead at the scene. ABC Polymer makes flat plastic sheets, using plastic extrusion assembly lines that pull the plastic sheeting through multiple clusters of large spinning rollers. The machine at issue was designed with a metal barrier that protects the operator from pinch points. The machine also has an interlock mechanism that stops the rollers from spinning if the guard is lifted. At ABC Polymer, it was standard practice to operate the machine with the guard up and the rollers still moving. Despite Despite several prior worker injuries, ABC managers still assigned Estelado to cut tangles out of plastic sheeting with a box cutter. She became entangled, and that's how she was killed. Now, OSHA initially issued a $195,000 uh, in fines to ABC for 19 violations that stemmed from the investigation. The company wound up paying about $155,000 in penalties for 13 violations, and OSHA's case was closed in August 2019. Now, on Monday, the Department of Justice announced criminal charges against the company for the willful violations of OSHA standards. Now, federal law makes it a Class B misdemeanor to willfully fail to follow OSHA safety standards when the failure causes the death of an employee. If convicted, ABC faces a fine of up to $500,000. Now, the Class B misdemeanor is the only federal criminal charge covering such workplace safety violations. And the reason I chose this story this week was because a lot of times when we cover these accidents, we seem to, uh, there's a little bit of anger towards OSHA because they don't have enough teeth. And to me, this showed that while OSHA might not have the teeth to really make uh, a point about um, habitual bad behavior, the Department of Justice can, and if anything, that should be a, just another another reason to not do it. Right. Um, this was, uh, and this is a story that we've been covering since it happened in 2017. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know, it just, uh, 
Uh, the other point of this is that, so in 2017, the victim's husband actually sued the company and was awarded $3 million in damages after a judge found that it was the VP of operations and the director of operations at ABC that removed the safety guards that would have prevented the accident. And it's just, you know, I get it if it's normal behavior that has been happening for a long time. This is how we've always done things, you know, despite if there have been previous injuries. But at some point, someone's got to say enough. You know, yeah. and stop it. And if it's going that high up in the operational chain, it's hard for, you know, middle managers to get in and mm -hmm. put a stop to it. I don't know. It was, uh, I don't know if you guys had a chance to read this story, but A, I was frustrated because it's something that we talk about it a lot. But B, I was a little bit hopeful because even though it seems like, you know, not huge penalties, at least the government can step in and, you know, uh, make it a little bit harder on the company. Yeah. Just potentially blast them with fines until they listen. Mm hmm um, yeah, that's what needs to happen here because this is just uh, completely outrageous. Yeah. And it's just, I don't know. Like, uh, when you look at, uh, this type of machine, the rollers, of uh, uh, I was watching videos of them online as to how they work and to think that you could operate near that thing safely when it wasn't off without any lockout. It just blew my mind. Mm -hmm. Blew my mind. Yeah. I mean, to your point, I would agree. It is good to finally see. Um, somebody taking more, having a greater level of accountability for these types of situations. So kudos to the DOJ for stepping in and, and really holding their feet to the fire. The other thing we're talking about here is in addition to this being a culture thing, a safety culture thing, we talk about that all the time when we're talking about this from an editorial perspective, is we're literally talking about seconds here mm -hmm. in terms of the process, yeah. improvement yeah. or, or not. Yeah. To flip, I mean... To, to put the guard up in order to continue to do work as opposed to leaving it off. I mean, come on. Mm -hmm. yeah. What are we talking about here? Um, Austin was wondering, uh, who carries the charge? Is it the plant floor manager who's liable on criminal charges? And I don't believe so. I think that um, a manager can be criminally negligent, but this in particular was just going after uh, the company yeah. uh, as a result of um, habitual behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because there can be, because managers can't like uh, can be on the hook if they were intentionally putting. Yeah, and this sounds like they were. I mean, to use a military term, sort of a chain of command thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it was a corporate policy almost to yeah bypass the OSHA reg. Mm -hmm. All right, Anna, what's your in case you missed it this week? All right, um, so uh, my story that I selected this week was about uh, Lowe's giving fifty five million dollars in bonuses to their frontline workers. Oh, I know. Um, so, uh, you know, it seems like they and other employers in the retail sector maybe are trying to raise the stakes to keep their talent and combat the impact of inflation. Um, so Lowe's announced that it would spend $55 million on bonuses and also offer 20% discounts on household and cleaning items to their um, hourly employees. Uh, this comes as manufacturers uh, continue to lose workers to retail and warehouse gigs. And I... Uh, Selected this story for that reason. Um, <laughs> you know, Lowe's sales were $96 billion last year. I get it that they are a massive chain mm -hmm. and $55 million to them is a viable expenditure in this case. And it's smart. They throw some cash at their employees, um, make people feel good, and they grab some positive press for it at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, I selected this story because I think manufacturers need to be watching this stuff. Um as, uh, as the story points out, the manufacturing industry is um, seeding ground to retail and to warehouse positions. And I think often it's because people still consider factories to be sort of dreary, windowless production work where you have very little flexibility. Um, you know, as wage rates increase out there and so do benefits like these, even if they're one-offs, manufacturers need to be upping their game. Mm -hmm. And I know, you know, most companies can't afford a move like Lowe's did here. $55 million is a lot. That's not what I'm suggesting. But, but like on scale. On scale, yeah. right. Like there's a lot that you can do, I think, you know, whether it's locally trying to get your name out, opening your doors so people can see what your facility looks like. But also um, from a incentives to your existing employee standpoint, like offer them some flex time, bring in bagels, give out gas cards. I don't know. I mean, it doesn't have to yeah. be huge, but that kind of stuff, I think, goes a long way. And it's easy to think that you gave everyone a cost of living increase last year and that's going to carry you through for the next five. It's not. Mm -hmm. That's not how things are working out there now. 
And so you have to be very careful, I think, um, when you're evaluating whether or not you're competitive with some of these other sectors. It used to be that retail and warehouse and service industries, like they were not keeping up with the wages that manufacturers were offering. That is changing. That gap is getting narrower and narrower. And so um, manufacturers need to really be keeping an eye on that. Well, and a benefit like 20% off uh, merchandise. Like, yeah. I mean, that's so, real. That's real. Yeah. Especially with the cost of materials out there. Um, no, I, I was actually, I found this, um, I found the story very encouraging. Um, and we've seen a couple of stories like this where companies come out and make a splash. I mean, one of the things I think about, cause you're right. Manufacturers could do more in terms of getting positive PR PR out there for their workers. But if you're a smaller operation, it's not going to be a number like 55 million, mm -hmm. you know? So how can they, how can manufacturers sort of get the word out there that like, you know, Hey, we are doing something, but we only got 30 guys or 30 people. And, uh, you know, we still gave them a 20% increase. Like, is that something that they should, you know, put out as a press release, like let us know so that way we could share for people, mm -hmm. um, you know, or is it just something they should post on LinkedIn? Um, yes. Yeah. All of it. All of it. Yeah. 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 I think, I think a big part of this too is something we're, we're hearing more and more about, especially like Gen Z and the millennial generation. But really, I think it goes beyond that to almost anybody is these types of things give you a sense of inclusion. Mm -hmm. It's not just you showing up every day and doing your job and getting paid and getting an inter incremental increase. You're part of a team. You're part of that community. You're part of the overall success of that organization. And that's becoming such a big part of people's desire to work or desire to choose a different workplace over another. And I think these types of things just reinforce that. And it shows how the workforce needs to, or the employment community needs to kind of evolve mm -hmm. in terms of how they prioritize different incentives to attract and retain people. Yeah. I think it's, yeah, I mean, it gets them a lot of great pub too. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Jeff, what was your, in case you missed it this week? So I looked at it, I thought this was kind of interesting. Duke Energy is going to test the F Ford 150 Lightning as a power grid backup. Yeah. So we've heard a lot of great things about this F-150 Lightning, the uh, the EV pickup from Ford. So Duke is looking for ways for its customers in Florida to be able to use what they call two-way or bi-directional charging from EVs to power either their homes or to help support the grid. Obviously, in Florida, they've got a lot of weather concerns down there, a lot of power outages. So what they're going to do is they're going to get a fleet of five of these Ford F-150s. They're going to use the Ford Charge Station Pro, an intelligent backup power home integration system, and this bidirectional charging infrastructure. So basically, they're going to use these vehicles to not only extract power from the grid, but once they're charged then, to potentially give power back to the grid. Mm -hmm. They would charge the vehicles using solar and other renewable energy sources so that when there are issues, they can potentially use these almost as mobile generators and going around to either help support um, recovery efforts um, while people are getting back on their feet or to actually feed some juice back into the grid, mm -hmm. which you would think would be huge for hospitals food stores, um, pharmacies, all of those types of places that in the case of emergency are still obviously very crucial. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really cool that we're looking at these vehicles that were developed just to be an EV, getting mm -hmm. from point A to point B mm -hmm. doing a, uh, as a work truck. And now they have these just expansive applications potentially and supporting our, our focus on lightening the load on the grid and just helping folks out in time of need. Yeah. Uh, there was a little bit of um, negative feedback on the website regarding how this isn't you know, a sustainable solution. And I would just like to say, it's not meant to be sustainable. Right. Yeah, it's it's just, meant to be when things go bad. Yeah. Um, because and this- it's a, it's a test. It, yeah, it's, it's a, a test. pilot. They're just seeing how what they can do. But yeah. this, I mean, very real happened uh, this last winter. Uh, the power went down at our cottage and uh, our pipes were going to blow. But my brother went up to the cottage, plugged the cottage into his car- and powered it until they were able to uh, uh, fix um, the electric company was able to come and fix it. Oh, yeah. um, you know, because we're talking like it was like minus 35 degrees out. Wow. And so, you know, pipes can go bad fast. And so when I read this, I was like, oh, no, this really can happen. Mm -hmm. You know, and I mean, especially, uh, you know, it was just a couple of weeks ago where I lost power for three days, four days and went out and bought a generator. If I could have just plugged my house into my car or a power station, like it would have been a game changer for us. And luckily we didn't lose the freezer, but my goodness. 
I almost lost my freezer. No, I think it's amazing um, how the F-150 has just taken on a new life almost mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. terms of its ability to retain all this power that it tracks as an EV and, and to share it in other ways. I mean, we saw it like save a wedding, like the power went out or something like that. Yeah. They plugged like, you know, the DJ and the lighting and everything else into the, into the truck. So kind of cool. Man, if that's my truck, I plug all the lights in. All the catering that needs to be plugged in, I do. And when that DJ comes, I'm just like, oh, man, I'm ran Take out of outlets. Out. <laughs> ran out of outlets. Sorry, man. I don't want to. Uh... So uh, Jesse, who's still watching us live, uh, says that amazing emergency applications for life-saving first responders also exist. And that's that's true. Like, you can have power in some of these remote situations, yeah. you know, and people are going to live as a result. Yeah. All right. Well, before, uh, Anna, did you have anything else about the Duke Energy? <laughs> Guess not. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse threw me. Uh, would you have anything to add? No, that's okay. Let's. Do, it's, it's fine. <laughs> it's weird now. No, let's lean into it. Have you ever had to power your house? Well, no, because oh, so well, you got solar panels. Um, is that something where if the power goes down, uh, you can power your house? Uh, in an emergency? No, we do not have a generator for our solar system. Um, we are tied to the uh, our utility. So if uh, the power goes out, we lose our power also because oh. um, they have to know that all of the lines are dead before they can do maintenance and stuff. And they would never want to accidentally have solar power running through any of those power lines and not know. Oh, so that's why they do. It's a safety measure. Gotcha, gotcha. You know, um, uh, electrocute the technician, right? Yeah, but it's something that we could explore if we wanted to do. There are like packages where you can do a generator and you know have your own home storage. Yeah, but. you would have like sort of the cell mm-hmm. uh, in your garage that you would power, and you could draw off of that. Right. Which okay. We do not have that now. No. Okay. Okay. But See? I agree that the the opportunities for with this bi-directional charging are really exciting, and I know for people that are in. Um, areas that are really sensitive to blackouts and brownouts and where the weather, like the heat in Texas, for example, where those situations got really, really dire for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, This would be a nice sort of insurance policy for some of those folks, I would think. Mm -hmm. Just another selling point for the F-150 that is already... How how far is it? You can't even get it. Yeah. 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 In three short years, you could have... (laughs) (laughs) All right. Uh, Well, before we get out of here, let's move on to our final thoughts. Um, Anna, what do you have for us this week for your final thought? Um, I just want to say thanks to everyone who tuned in last week for our remote session. I hope that wasn't weird. We um, (laughs) did our best. (laughs) (laughs) We were really trying to not get COVID. There was a lot of COVID happening. Sorry. In in the office. Mm -hmm. Not David's fault. David was... I wasn't patient zero. Collateral damage. No, I wasn't patient zero. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So anyway... uh, but um, I know my my seven year old made a guest appearance on <laughs> last week. She really wants to be on stage. I think so. She popped in for a minute. But um, so yeah, if if it happens again, we'll we'll come live from our homes again. But hopefully not. Yeah, yeah. we'll just we got to get better with the. Uh, um, you know, we talked about having like a a go to podcast setup at our houses. Yeah. During like when we were quarantined. Um, and it was one of those things where once it was lifted, it's like, we'll never need that again. Yeah, that's not going <laughs> to be an issue from here on out, right? Yeah. Um, to piggyback on that, my final thought is that COVID sucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I started getting sick um, like last Monday. And it was one of those, I, I talked to you guys in the office where I'm like, you know, I'm just not feeling right. And uh, I made it home. And like passed out until Wednesday. Oh, like um, I slept. Yeah, I. Uh, um, my wife woke me up to go get the kids, and I was like, "What time is it?" You know, just way out of it. And uh, it went from I basically I I mean I joke about it, but for like two and a half days, I would wake up, drink as much fluid as I could, and eat way too much. It turns out that you know you can gain quite a bit of weight if all you're doing is sleeping <laughs> and eating. <laughs> Got to watch that. Um, but it's also uh, I think a good reminder that uh, there's a lot of s- people are going through a lot of stress and there's still like a lot of mental health issues out there as a result of people coming out of the quarantine and um, just going back and trying to manage that for the last two weeks uh, has been a good reminder that like this was hard and stressful and we kind of just jump back into things yeah. like every, like nothing had happened. And I think that it's just a good reminder that like, oh, you know, People might be on tilt still because, you know, that's all still in us. We got to get it out of there. Like, uh, but um, 
hopefully I'll be back in the office at a more regular basis. We're just uh, passing the COVID baton uh, like every week and a half at my house. So mm-hmm. hopefully, you know, I'll be back full time once, uh, you know, school allows the kids back in. Yeah. But uh, no, it's uh, so just just a reminder, like when people seem a little stressed out out there, like maybe they're having a bad day, week or two years. So yeah. just give them a minute. And if you need help, find those resources. Yeah. Um, Jeff, what is your final thought this week? Um, also touching on COVID, I think Jameson whiskey must have some sort of immunity element to it because how was I around all of you guys? And I, I have not tested positive for Apparently COVID. gin's like, an accelerator. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's just uh, like COVID gets into the gin and yeah. then in all the blood vessels. I think, I think whiskey's the- Irish whiskey must just be the repellent. It yeah. must Ugh. just be the ultimate. If you like uncovered something, we're like, because so what, like uh, 20% of our office didn't get COVID. Mm -hmm. If it happened to be like the 20% that was drinking whiskey, I mean, head of the CDC for Jeff. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Either that or something in those like immunization guns that I got hit with when I went through basic training. Yeah. Because I'm not really sure what was in there, but like I went through this line, I had two people on either side with those guns. It's boom, boom. And you had to keep moving. I don't know. What was you that? got yeah. some kind yeah, of there was some sort of internal super shield serum in there or something. No. no, well, I mean, also to that point, like I I had the vaccine and it still like knocked me down. So I couldn't imagine yeah. what it would have been. And my family has had a real rough go when it comes to COVID. Like yeah. people that both made it out and didn't. But uh, so I just you know I was thankful that I had it. And couldn't imagine how much worse because you know some of our coworkers were rocking like fevers of like one hundred three, one hundred four. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. uh. Yeah. My eyes got hot. That's how bad it was. It was, it was <laughs> oh, a, all of a sudden, I would wake up and my eyes were hot. I'm like, that's probably not good. That is not a best practice. No. Uh, do we have any trivia going on this week? We do. Nice. All right. So here is my revamp trivia program approach, whatever. <laughs> um, okay. So I was trying to figure out a way to do something like this because we got a lot of great feedback and participation. And I like doing it too. But like I wanted to make sure it was something people just just Google like or mm-hmm. look it up somewhere because that's kind of what was happening. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna ask a question each week based on the podcast. Mm. The results will come from our readership. So we will send this information out to our readership, this question out and these answers, and we'll see what the readership says. In the meantime, send me your responses, but it's gonna be based on what you think our manufacturing group readership thinks of this question. So you're going to poll our readers. Right. And they're going to answer. <clears throat> and they're, t- yeah, we're, it's, yeah. I, uh, it's uh, today manufacturing feud. Yeah. Um, right. But uh, so you're going to ask this question, poll all of our readers, and then their top answer is what you're looking is for. Is the answer. Okay. It's the, yeah, the winning answer. Okay. We'll do some other stuff too. Once I send it out, if you're in that, it's going to be like a random 500 people that we survey. Um, if you're in there, there's going to be some incentives to survey and participate as well. So nice. if you want to be part of those that are included, let me know. All right. But the question here based on this week's podcast is which organization's management team do you think handled their situation the worst? Okay. So we've got 3M in terms of the whole situation with the product development, with the uh, the earplug and what, everything they did wrong there. The city of San Francisco in terms of trying to figure out a garbage can. <laughs> we know Jeff's answer. No. <laughs> Um, how do you say, is it just stamp? Uh, Gestamp. Gestamp in terms of how they handle that employee, um, with his emergency appendectomy and let him know over Facebook messenger, British volt in terms of how they're handling, um, just getting their, their, uh, facility up and running or BMW in the whole situation they're involving their, uh, testing of that semi-automated vehicle, not mm-hmm. autonomous. So which organization do you feel handled their situation the worst? Is it 3M, San Francisco, Gestamp, British Volt, or BMW? We're going to survey our readership. They're going to tell us the right answer. You tell me what you think they're going to say is mm. the best answer. You got to you gotta ask it in a more like beauty sort of way. Like Top we, five answers on the board. <laughs> we asked 500 people, which organization's management team handled their situation the worst? Five answers on the board, Jeff. There we go. Which host? That's what it is. Which host, though? It has to be Harvey. I mean, Steve Harvey's just crushing it right now. Oh, I love Steve Harvey. Yeah. I think he does a, an amazing job. Yeah. Like, uh, if I could just get a 24-hour loop of Family Feud highlights mm-hmm. and his reactions, that might be my only programming. Who could pull off his suits, though? Could anybody else wear <sighs> no, his suits one, but him? No. No. I want to see his closet. Like, <laughs> it's amazing. It's like Saul Goodman. 
<laughs> well, he uh, he showed off his closet a little bit. He was in uh, Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee with Seinfeld and uh, just railed on Seinfeld's choice of uh, <laughs> attire the entire time. His closet has to be magical. Real magical place. All right. Well, we have one more comment before Jesse. Jesse, a warm spot in my heart. Jesse says, peanut butter and jelly and Cheetos sandwiches for the win. You're right, Jesse. Jelly too? I've heard of peanut butter and no, it's, Cheetos. Yeah, the jelly is nonsense. I didn't want to get into that. But, you know, Ooh. I mean, peanut butter and Cheetos. And actually, Flaming Hot Cheetos or nothing. And, uh, oh, Austin says got my 15 minutes of fame. Well, stick with us, Austin. We'll give you some more. And uh, one more comment from Jesse. She says Jin kept her safe. That's no good. What? Oh, jeez. One more. All right. Uh, one more. Then we're getting out of here. Austin says, cheers, y'all. Good time and great conversations. Oh, that's a nice one. Do you want to high five Austin again? No, nah, that's just, <laughs> just do, one it more. turns out. It turns out that was maybe not the maybe not the best, you know, just like, you know what? There we go. We high five. That's for the audio version for the video version. Sorry, guys. <laughs> audio high five. <laughs> Never been done. <laughs> All right. Well, before we get out of here. Thank you for everyone watching us live. Also, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You can also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. Finally, if you want to email the podcast, you can reach any of us at Jeff, David, or Anna at IN.com with email the podcast in the subject line. Finally, make sure to subscribe to our daily and weekly newsletters. And make sure you get the podcast delivered to your inbox first. All right, for Jeff and Anna, I'm David Manti. This is the Today in Manufacturing Podcast. And we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Today in Manufacturing podcast.